right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's wonderful to see people who are starting to join. Please uh, give us a minute or two to uh, populate. Uh, we have a large attendance today. I wanna let everybody jump on. So uh, you're in the right place at the right time. Just hang in there for a minute. <clears throat> For those of you who are still signing on and joining, we're watching the numbers go up a bit. Uh, you're in the right place. Just be patient a little bit and we will, uh, we will uh, be starting very soon. According to my uh, watch right here, we have uh, the time is 4.03. I'm going to wait till about 4.04 .04, and then we'll begin. Oh. All right, I think what we will begin, uh, and I know more people will be joining us. Uh, we're almost up to, I see almost 200, so we will uh, begin. It is my pleasure to welcome you, all of you, to this very special webinar entitled A Just and Lasting Peace, featuring today our very special guest, uh, the author of a brand new book entitled Lincoln and the Fight for Peace, Mr. John Ablin. Um, I'll be offering Mr. Ablon a proper introduction in just a few minutes. But before doing so, uh, permit me to offer just a few introductory words. I'm Gary Zola, and I am the executive director of the Jacob Rader Marcus Center of the American Jewish Archives and professor of the American Jewish Experience on the historic Cincinnati campus of Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion. The college is the oldest continuous, continuously existing institution of higher Jewish learning in the United States. It's my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon and uh, we're very honored to host this uh, learning session. We want to extend to all who are joining us a warm welcome and especially to those of you who are first timers. Uh, let me take a, a minute just to introduce you to the American Jewish Archives. As I said, we are located here in Cincinnati on the campus of Hebrew Union College. The American Jewish Archives was founded in 1947 by the distinguished historian and pioneering scholar of American Jewish history, Dr. Jacob Rader Marcus. And over the past 75 years since its founding, the AJA has grown steadily and it is today the world's largest freestanding research center dedicated solely to the study of the American Jewish experience. The AJA's fundamental mission is to preserve and to promulgate the history of Jewish life in America. Now, before I introduce our distinguished guest speaker, permit me just to mention a few technical matters relating to the webinar itself. 
first of all, you probably already could see that you're only able to see Mr. Avalon and myself, uh, no one else. And uh, that's uh, uh, on purpose. There's nothing wrong. Uh, we will be fielding questions after the initial presentation. So you can feel free to enter your questions into the chat, which is on, and we will be harvesting those questions and we'll try to deal with as many of them as we possibly can. Now, at the conclusion of our webinar, which will go maybe just a little more than an hour, there's going to be some brief and very important announcements. And especially for those of you who are interested in purchasing Mr. Avalon's book on Lincoln. So you do not want to jump off prematurely. You want to stay on so we can give you those uh, that information. And tomorrow, all of you who've registered and all of you who are attending will be receiving a follow-up mailing so that you can remain in touch with the American Jewish Archives, receive notification of other educational opportunities that we offer from time to time. And you will also find out as I said, how to obtain a copy, not only a copy, but potentially a, uh, an autograph copy of Lincoln and the fight for peace. Now, we are recording this afternoon's webinar and that will become available after tomorrow as is usually the case. It will be located once it's been recorded on the website of the American Jewish Archives and also on Hebrew Union Colleges special online learning website. And we'll again remind you at the end how to gain access to the recording at the conclusion. So now, without any further to do, uh, let's begin. I was uh, so attracted to uh, this volume. Uh, I've had the opportunity to uh, work on Lincoln myself and I just wanted to bring this fascinating topic uh, to our audience. Uh, John Ablon, as most here online know, is an author, a columnist, a commentator, and I think you are familiar with his very significant role as a senior political analyst and fill an anchor at CNN. He appears on New Day every single morning with his great political commentary known as Reality Check. Uh, you may also know that from 2013 to 2018, he was the editor in chief and managing director of the Daily Beast, which is an American news website that focuses on politics, media, culture, and so forth. Uh, Mr. Avalon is a prolific author. And if you have not already done so, I recommend personally that you read his excellent books that have already appeared. I'm referring to Independent Nation, which really sheds wonderful light on the crucial central role of political centrism. And then there's a book called Wingnuts, which focuses on the antipode of that, which is the dangers of political extremes, whether on the left or on the right. And I love his volume on Washington's Farewell Address. The uh, book is entitled Fair, uh, Washington's Farewell. And that's, the content of that is equally timely and enriching. In addition to appearing daily on CNN and his many activities, he's been on so many primetime TV shows such as The Daily Show, The Late Show with Stephen Colbert and Real Time with Bill Maher. You may know, of course, that he and his wife, Margaret Hoover, are who, Margaret, who is, a, is, is the host of PBS's Firing Line. They live together with their two children, Jack and Tula Lou, uh, in New York City. So without any further delay, John, we're so honored to have you. Thank you so very much for being with us. It's my pleasure and my privilege to put the floor under your feet. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, all listeners, Mr. John Avlin. Oh, Gary, that's very kind of you. Thank you. And um, it's an honor to be with you all. I, I have such esteem for the, the work of the American Jewish Archives, mostly because as a historian and a journalist, um, I think it's vitally important that we 
preserve and present a vision of American history that has all the diversity uh, that it always did, but sometimes got simplified in our retelling of the American story. And when we look closer uh, at, at our history, I think we find uh, that that it, it makes the story all the more inspiring to understand the essential diversity of our country from its earliest days as a democratic republic. Um, and that's something I try to highlight in, in, in my work, but you all are dedicated to every day. Um, and one day I hope to visit you all in Cincinnati. Uh, I, I, I told you earlier that my, my mother's family is from Youngstown, Ohio. So I'm, I got to the Northeast side of the state a lot more than the Southeast, uh, Southwest, but um, all in due time. Um, this book is called Lincoln and the Fight for Peace. And, you know, the rational question when you're embarking on a book on Lincoln is, um, you know, who would be foolish enough to try to write a book uh, when, when the subject's already been covered by 16,000 other volumes? Um, and, and it's a legitimate question. Um, and, and, and when I came up with this idea of, of focusing on Lincoln's plan to win the peace after winning the war, his vision of national re reconciliation and reunification, um, I, I went and I spoke to some scholars and, and uh, in the Lincoln space to, to see if it had been done before. And I remember standing in the Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln uh, bookshop in Chicago, Illinois, which was started by Carl Sandburg in the 1930s. And it's a great place if you ever travel up to Chicago. It's three rooms, books only about Abraham Lincoln. I remember talking to the proprietor, a guy named Daniel Weinberg, who's been there for 50 years, I think, and told him the idea. And he scanned the room, all these books on Lincoln and the Civil War. And he said, Lincoln, the peacemaker. Well, I'll be darned. I don't think anybody's done that. And the reason nobody's done that is because, of course, Lincoln is assassinated five days after Appomattox. He doesn't have a chance to implement his vision of how to win a peace after winning the war. But what I did in this book is connect all his speeches and statements and conversations that gave sort of meat on the bones, if you will, of his vision of how you win a peace after winning the war. And, and this was Lincoln's core insight. You know, we forget, but there'd never been a civil war fought on such a scale before. And yeah, you know, d democracy was certainly at stake. America was the largest, you know, democracy in the world at the time, really, by some counts, the world's sole democracy. And all the autocrats and and, 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 and aristocrats and monarchists over in Europe certainly were, were waiting for us to fail. Certainly freedom is on the line. At the time we've got 4 million enslaved Americans of African descent um, living in bondage in the South. Um, but L Lincoln understood in a, in a very profound and deep way was that if you didn't win the peace, you couldn't win this war. And that's because in a civil war, you can't simply pound your opponents in, into submission and salt their fields. You need to find a way to live together again. And that takes a new kind of leadership, a leadership focused on reconciliation. And that's a type of leadership, a style of leadership that does not do what typical political leaders do, which is divide to conquer. Try to pit people against each other, uh, which is the usual way people come to political power in some way, shape, or form. Now, e even in the middle of a civil war, Lincoln was focusing on his belief, his stubborn belief in some respects, that there was more than unites us than divides us as Americans. But of course, that belief was tested every day. And one of the things that reconciling leaders do is they're able to focus on a future that is not predetermined by the pain of the past or the present. They're able to get outside the cause and effect of violence that leads people logically to desire more violence in pursuit of vengeance, because reconciliation is the opposite of revenge. But of course, leadership is not a philosophical exercise, and, and Lincoln developed a plan to win the peace. On the top level, his prescription to win the peace is unconditional surrender followed by a magnanimous peace. 
unconditional surrender followed by a magnanimous peace. But he knew that would need to be buttressed by plans that dealt with political reform, um, that dealt with economic expansion, and then cultural reintegration. Because reuniting a nation is not simply a matter of politics. But let's talk about unconditional surrender. And I'll do it by telling a, a story uh, about Lincoln. And this is in February of 1865. So um, it's right after um, the 13th Amendment has passed, the Constitutional Amendment, which would end slavery, because the Emancipation Proclamation was a wartime executive order. It wasn't sufficient to end slavery for all time. And it's before he gives his second inaugural address, which culminates in that immortal paragraph with malice toward none, with charity for all with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. Lincoln actually conducts the first only wartime peace negotiation led by an American president on the River Queen, which was sort of an aquatic Air Force One. It was the presidential steamship. And Ulysses S. Grant brought over um, three leading Confederates who wanted to find a way to talk peace. They included um, Vice President Alexander Stevens, um, Senator and a uh, Assistant Secretary of War. Um, and Lincoln broke the ice with humor. He had relationships, you know, he'd served in Congress with Alexander Stevens when they were both members of the Whig Party. Um, he made it be very clear up front that, you know, <laughs> they could have peace anytime they want. But he gave them a handwritten note with three indispensable conditions for peace. The first two are pretty obvious. One is um, an end to slavery for all time. Everyone understood at this point that slavery was the cause of the war, that you would need to remove the root cause of the war in order to ensure there was not another war that would uh, sort of ignite on the ashes of the past. The second, also fairly self-evident, and resumption of federal authority, that the secessionist states would have to rejoin the Union and ascribe to the laws under the Constitution, and um, that that would renounce any theoretical right to secession that some states had asserted. But the third was really unexpected and, to me, fascinating, and I think it illustrates Lincoln's depth of thought, that he was a long-term thinker in an environment in a profession, frankly, where a lot of short-term decisions drive calculations. He said, no ceasefire before surrender. No ceasefire before surrender. Well, ironically, you know, the Confederates were all ready to offer him a ceasefire before surrender. In fact, they offered up one plan that was really kind of bonkers, uh, which was to, to get uh, the North and South, they said, would sign a ceasefire and then they would reunite and invade Mexico together to dislodge the Emperor Maximilian. Um, under the sort of idea that, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, they would reunite the nation and then they'd work out the details. Lincoln said, no, that's an absurd idea, but on, on two counts. One, I can't offer a ceasefire through Congress, uh, as you have suggested, because it would recognize your sovereignty as an independent nation. And Lincoln never acknowledged legitimacy of the South to secede, much to their irritation. So he could not treat them as an independent nation because that would dignify the idea of secession. The second reason was, is that he, even though he understood that a ceasefire before surrender would be popular, it would stop the killing immediately. Lincoln had been called a butcher and a tyrant. Um, but what Lincoln understood was that if he granted a ceasefire before surrender, um, then he feared that the political will to end slavery would evaporate and the 13th Amendment would not be ratified. And so armed really with his understanding of human nature, he insists that there has to be unconditional surrender, which he promises will be followed by a magnanimous peace. And he has told them his vision of a magnanimous peace. You know, he doesn't want the, 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 the leading secessionists, the members of the courts and Congress, the military, who'd left the Union to support this traitorous rebellion, to be able to regain all their power back immediately. He didn't want that. But on the other end, he didn't believe they should be executed either, which is the traditional punishment for treason. He wanted to get the rank and file, Confederate rank and file. He wanted to be extraordinarily forgiving to them. Um, he believed they had been misled. And he wanted to tie 
the fortunes of free blacks to this example of mercy uh, to the Confederate rank and file. Um, and, and he had laid this out in presidential proclamations and in conversations that I recount, including in the famous portrait, The Peacemakers, which occurred on March 29th, 1865, on the River Queen later. Um, but Lincoln is always thinking, even in the darkest days of the war, he's thinking about putting together policies with Republicans in Congress, which he feels would help heal the nation after the war's end, economic policies. See, what Lincoln also was determined to do was to move the nation's attention from that north-south divide to move it west, armed with economic opportunity. So one of the things that, that Lincoln does in the darkest days of the war with Republican Congress is they pass laws like the Transcontinental Railroad Act to reunite, to, to really unite the nation for functionally for the first time. He, he pushes through the uh, Homestead Act, encouraging people to move west and get their own land. Uh, land grant colleges, which are enormously important uh, to sort of the, the diffusion of knowledge, practical knowledge throughout the nation. And all this was designed to have people move west after the war, to help reunite the nation with a shared sense of optimism and shared investment in, 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 a, in a more bountiful economic future, and, and to get their minds off the irritation of the North-South divide. And incidentally, one of the things Lincoln did to show his optimism of the future, in addition to determination to win the war, is he more than doubled the size of immigration during his presidency. Um, and a lot of people said, well, why would you do that? Because you're, you know, if you succeed, there are going to be a number of former slaves who flood the labor market. And he said, no, you know, we, we want new immigrants to this country and, and they will they will all move west. We've got plenty of room. Uh, and, and, and he was particularly enthusiastic about the opportunity he believed that existed in the, the mineral riches of the West, which he believed would help pay up the debt. But, but he knew that the, the cultural integration would take longer, but he also understood that that would be a function of time, that communities needed to feel a sense of investment uh, in their own reconstruction, that it couldn't simply be imposed uh, from on high, from Washington. Um, but here's where Lincoln's extraordinary understanding of human nature really shown through and how it's reflected in his leadership. You know, I, I, I believe that leadership is often a reflection of something as basic as a person's personality. And that gets translated into their principles, which are then reflected in their politics and their principles uh, and, and their, and their policies. And, 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 you know, as someone who also believes that politics are to some extent, you know, projection of psychology out into the world writ large. I, I think if you look at the essential qualities of Lincoln's um, personality, um, I think you begin to get a better understanding of his reconciling leadership style. Um, and while we'll never find another Lincoln, we can look for people with similar qualities. So it's worth delineating them, I think. I, I think the defining qualities of Lincoln's personality um, are certainly an absence of malice, but really driven by empathy, honesty, humor, and humility. And I'll talk a little bit about, about each of them. Um, empathy is a quality that's been strained in our own time. And to perpetuate that from the level of president during a civil war is truly extraordinary. But you saw him do it in ways big and small. He said, look, I'm not anti-South, I'm not anti-Southern, I'm anti-slavery. He also said, don't judge them because they are just what we would be if we were in their position. It takes enormous moral imagination. He also makes arguments against slavery that involve that same degree of empathy and moral imagination, saying, I never knew of a good thing that any man did not want for himself. In private and in public, it's interesting, he, he didn't divide to conquer with a lot of rhetorical red meat, although that was a very standard political style in his time. He would say things like, he would call uh, Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee, in public and private, Jeffy D. and Bobby Lee. And, and I love that. Um, I love that because it's, it's, it's a little dismissive, but it's familiar. It's a reminder that a civil war is at the end of the day a familial fight. So he set that example. And he, he set that example uh, consistently. There's an amazing story that I, I, I recount in the book where he's walking through a, a depot field hospital towards the end of the war. And he spends hours, as presidents do today, at, at Walter Reed Hospital, shaking the hands of wounded warriors. And, 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 and when he's finished over a series of hours, shaking hundreds, if not thousands, of hands, 
he spies a, a, a smaller tent out back and he asks the attending physician who's walking with him, what's that? And the guy says, well, you don't need to, you don't need to go there. You don't need to worry about that. Those are just wounded rebel soldiers. And Lincoln stood up to his full height and said, that's exactly where I do need to go. And then he went and he introduced himself to all the wounded Confederate soldiers. That's grace. That's magnanimity. That's empathy in action. Honesty uh, was also a core quality of his personality. And it, it, won, it was one that, I mean, even his opponents and his enemies could not credibly deny. You know, we hear honest Abe today, and I think there's a tendency to think that, well, that's a little bit of post-assassination mythology. But actually, it was his reputation in his own time. And I found interviews contemporary and after his death where, I mean, Jefferson Davis, Stephen Douglas, um, his wife, you know, would, would, would all say, you know, that, that for all the things they disagreed with, he was honest. And his honesty was uh, an important part of why he won the Republican nomination. Um, but it, it really it aided him enormously when he was negotiating with his opponents um, because they knew they might not agree with him. And Lord knows they would demonize him uh, at every chance they got. But they knew that he was honest and therefore his word could be trusted. And that itself gave enormous credibility. Um, Humor is, I think, the quality we least associate with Lincoln, in, unless you know him well, because he seems so stern and stentorian in the Lincoln Memorial, but it's the most wonderful thing about him, um, both as a, as a communications tool. I mean, he told jokes and stories all the time, um, really buoyed by his belief and his, his childhood reading of Aesop, that he believed that, you know, he said, common people take them as they run, uh, are more likely to understand a, a, a complex point through the a story. And it, it, it also would do it in private as a managerial tool because it, it, it allowed him to uh, communicate in, in, a, in a less direct way that might save him from hurting somebody's feelings. He also used humor all the time. Um, and actually, he was famous for it. I mean, there were books of his jokes, pamphlets being sold even in the South. Um, it was an enormously effective tool, but it was also the way he talked and he took a lot of heat for it because people said, how can you be joking at a time like this? You know, they didn't think he was serious. They didn't think he was up to the task. I mean, on top of the fact that he hadn't, you know, hold executive office or military office, here's a guy walking around the middle of a civil war who'd only served one term in Congress a decade before, and he kept telling jokes all the time. I think not only did those folks miss how many of the stories and jokes had a point to them and was a communications tool, but how much it was self-medication. And, and, and one story really uh, made that come alive to me, which was um, after one brutal Union defeat in 1862, 1862 was a tough year. Um, one of Lincoln's friends, Isaac N. Arnold, a congressman from Illinois, came up to visit the president in the White House. And at the time, you could just sort of walk in. Uh, there was any of the security protocols there are today. And he walked upstairs and, 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 and found the president reading by the fire. He's reading a pamphlet of his favorite humorist, Artemis M. Ward, and he's laughing. And Arnold is furious at his friend. And he lays into him and says, how can you laugh at a time like this? And Lincoln throws down the book and looks up to him. And in Arnold's memoirs, he says, with eyes streaming, with filling with tears, he says, don't you understand that if I could not find a way to laugh, my heart would break and I couldn't do my job. So the humor was, was also a form of, of self-medication. Um, and, and finally, humility, um, by which I mean a moral humility. Humility is the word I think we think of least in political leadership today. Um, you know, Lincoln is, is a magnanimous man. He's a moderate man. He's of moderate temperament as well as moderate politics. Um, but that moral humility is really key. It's not that he's not ambitious. I mean, he's ambitious. Um, I mean, you don't get from a you know dirt floored log cabin to the White House without being ambitious. But he had a Midwestern modesty about him that was very appealing and reflected his sort of moderate self-effacing politics, his self-effacing humor. And it's that moral humility that I think, you know, went full circle to aid his empathy. You see it in the, in the second inaugural address where, look, he, he takes on this idea that, you know, well, maybe the, the, the civil wars about economics or 
states' rights or rights. He said, no, this is about slavery. But then he does something really interesting is, is while there's no moral equivalence about the North and South with regard to slavery, he does not let the North rest easy with a sense of moral superiority. Because he says, look, the Civil War is God's punishment for the original sin of slavery. And he's punishing the North and the South. And no one's fully in control. Um, and, and that's because we bought the rice. We bought the cotton. We're complicit too. And, and that's a message that met real calls and responses from the uh, Black Americans, Black Union soldiers in, in the audience, the first integrated inaugural in American history. Uh, uh, and you know, Well over 100,000 Black Union soldiers served, 25 won the Medal of Honor. But, but that's a very Old Testament vision. And indeed, most of, I think, the, the Lincoln's second inaugural is a very Old Testament speech until the final paragraph. Um, but, but I think it's so characteristic of, of, of Lincoln's leadership, um, which is moral humility is, is, is a virtue. And so he is able to have moral courage without assuming a sense of moral superiority, right? He, he's a moderate man by temperament. He balances moderation with moral courage but he does not allow moral courage to drift into a sense of moral superiority. And I think that is such an essential equation for reconciling leadership. And one that we don't see a lot of today. You know, and of course, Lincoln is assassinated when we need him most. He really was a man of peace in a time of war and he was getting ready to do the work he seemed to have been born for, which is to oversee a magnanimous peace and to, to show that we could stop the cycle of violence. But he never got a chance to do that. And he was replaced by the, the, the worst possible person, a man who was not a reconciler, but who was alternately radical and reactionary. Um, Andrew Johnson, a man who uh, I found a quote in the Atlantic magazine, which described him as being thin skinned to the point of mental illness or no, vain, vain and egotistic to the point of mental illness. And America went off the Lincoln path and, and, and we lost the peace for a time. And, and while Ulysses S. Grant did a lot to bring it back, I mean, one function of not fully winning the peace was um, segregation replacing slavery for a century. Um, you know, typically a book on Lincoln would end with Lincoln's life or perhaps immediately after, but my book takes a, an unexpected turn because it really, I'm always interested in the, the afterlife of ideas. And, and Lincoln's prescription to win the peace, unconditional surrender followed by a magnanimous peace. Um, when Woodrow Wilson was president, if you look at the failures of the Treaty of Versailles and they're notorious, um, what did we do? Well, we granted a ceasefire before surrender. There were no Allied troops in the First World War on German soil. The Germans never fully accepted defeat. And then sort of punishing reparations were put on a country that never fully accepted defeat, uh, reparations that they couldn't fully pay, um, but that the Allied allies didn't have the will to enforce the terms of surrender, which is the worst of all worlds. And, and, and as, a, as a French field marshal said at the time, this isn't a peace uh, treaty. This is a ceasefire for 20 years. But then after the Second World War, America and its allies really embraced that Lincolnian formulation of unconditional surrender followed by a magnanimous peace. Indeed, that was explicitly the policy embraced by Franklin Della Roosevelt and, and Winston Churchill. Um, you know, unconditional surrender. And actually, I found a quote where Franklin Delano Roosevelt describes the concept of unconditional surrender by invoking the story of, of Grant's surrender, uh, or Lee's surrender to Grant at Appomattox which effectively was just Grant taking dictation from Lincoln um, in all their meetings in the days before that occurred. And, and then a magnanimous peace is what was effectively enacted um, in Germany, Japan, and the Marshall Plan, particularly the Marshall Plan. Um, and, and Harry Truman, um, who, who said, looking back on his own family's experience uh, with resentment in the wake of the Civil War, he said, you know, I didn't want resentment to be my generation's gift to the next. And, and, and 
really what Arthur Vandenberg and, and, and Marshall and Truman were able to do, uh, not only created a bulwark against communism, but, but it helped win the peace in such a way that we have had 75 years of relative peace on the European continent, which is a total historic anomaly. And I think just as I think America has taken democracy for granted in recent decades and now as I think awakened to the fact we cannot do that, I think that, um, that the, the, the organizations and institutions were put in place after the First World, Second World War to win the peace had also begun to be taken for granted. And I think Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine has awakened people to the fact that those cannot be wisely taken for granted either. Um, but that that essential wisdom from Lincoln that he handed down, and, and so much of his wisdom, I think, animates our better angels of our nature even today. The fact that Lincoln's example of, of empathy and honesty and humor and humility carries forward. The fact that he reminds us that kindness can be consistent with effective leadership, that greatness is dependent upon goodness. Um, those are the, some of the reasons, just some of the reasons why Lincoln's example carries forward, but in practical ways as well. Um, Lincoln's example, Lincoln's vision was vindicated long after his death. Um, there's so many more things I could talk about with y'all, but I'd much rather have a conversation uh, and take questions. So let's go in that direction. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, uh, John. That was really wonderful. Uh, I want to sure. hold this book up for everybody to see. Um, I really appreciate you focusing so much, uh, John, on the points that uh, how often in the book you connect uh, that which is, uh, which happened in the story of Lincoln and struggling to anticipate what will happen at the end of the uh, Civil War in terms of reuniting the nation and bringing it up to our own time, which is so divided. And uh, uh, the um, the beautiful, beautiful last paragraph that you write in your book. I know I can see there are a few of my colleagues, my rabbinic colleagues on line, and many of them are probably thinking, what on earth am I going to talk about for the high holy days? And I, I just think that taking a look at John's book might be very helpful because and, and here I'll lead into my first question that you really argue, as you've just now done, you argue uh, that the fundamental contours of Lincoln's plan for peace were discernible, even if they weren't implemented, mm -hmm. that, that, that they could be seen and that they weren't implemented as you point out, because he was you know, tragically murdered. But, in the final book uh, paragraph, which is so beautiful, at least I felt it was so beautiful and beautifully written, you say and you argue that the fundamentals of Lincoln's plan, uh, which you've identified, uh, actually are rhetorically embedded into his second inaugural address, which has often been referred to as a sermon and not really uh, a, a, poli a political speech. And you identify them in the following way, as you've just done in your talk. Forgiveness and love, righteous behavior and determination, compassion through action, and most of all, you say, courage. And as you've just done now, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm talking now to those uh, who might be with us who are thinking about, you know, messages for the new year. And these are very powerful ideas, but you say that these fundamentals work when they're carried out. That's what you were just, uh, you know, at the end, um, you know, where you were uh, saying that uh, World War One is an example of when they were not carried out and World War II, maybe more so. Uh, and so considering all of this, here's my question. In light of uh, all that uh, has come to light 
since your book actually appeared. And I know the book you you saw January 6th before the book appeared, but now we know all the more, even more. I want to ask you, do you think that Lincoln's plan really and truly is showing us the way. That's the last line of your book. Lincoln's plan can still show us the way. Tell us a little about that. I think that's very interesting. I, I, I do. And, and as I say, it's not that we're gonna find another Lincoln, but we can look to leaders for the similar spirit. Um, you know, Lincoln uh, is, is you know, largely a, a secular saint today of our democratic republic, but he was hated his lifetime. It's not about achieving unanimity, but I think the right kind of reconciling leadership is absolutely essential to healing a nation. And it is about combining moral courage uh, with moderation. It, it, it is about putting compassion into action. It is about drawing on faith as well as humor and scripture to try to bridge uh, deep, deep divides. Um, and I think it's about it's about a belief in a magnanimous peace following victory. Um, uh, you know, we have all sorts of different challenges um, than the ones uh, Lincoln faced. Um, but I think these are these this is wisdom embedded, um, reflected in scripture in some places, but I think embedded in Lincoln's understanding of human nature. And, and you know, technology obviously may be a new thing, but but human nature isn't. I, I will reflect, as I do in the book, you know, to something Ulysses S. Grant said a decade after Appomattox. And he said, if we are to have another civil war, I'd predict the dividing line won't be between Mason and Nixon. He says, I think it'll become be between patriotism um, uh, on the one hand and superstition and ignorance on the other. Um, and, and, and I do think that we need to um, be aware, um, in particular, that whenever our politics... And this perhaps isn't only true to the United States, but I think it's particularly dangerous for the United States. Uh, whenever our politics start uh, falling into tribal divides, that's when we need to beware. We need to resist that gravitational impulse um, from an elevated plane. And that's what that's what reconciling leaders do. But I think that's what we all need to do as citizens in the way that we all in a democratic republic have an obligation to lead in our own communities, in our own families, in our own friend group. Um, it, 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 we must try to rise above and focus on our common humanity. Um, and, and I think if Lincoln was able to do that in the middle of civil war, surely we can aspire to the same. Well, thank you. Uh, I. Uh, wanted to point out to everybody that uh, it, John has taught us it, that Lincoln was constantly under pressure uh, in, his, in, in your conclusion. I think it's on page 262. You, you say that uh, peace activists clamored for an end to the Civil War, an end at any cost. And uh, even the cost might be the perpetuation of slavery or even a permanent division in the nation. And uh, I thought uh, that the audience might uh, find interesting uh, a document that I wanna share that uh, appeared in my book that I, I mentioned to John. Everybody here, you're, you're looking at a picture of two figures from the Civil War. On the right, on your right, you're seeing Issachar Zachary, who's a very, very interesting figure, who was a chiropodist, and he was uh, President Lincoln's uh, foot doctor. Uh, but this man was doing a lot more than uh, trimming Lincoln's toenails. Uh, he uh, entrusted one Lincoln's trust, and Lincoln encourages him to go down to Louisiana because uh, Mr. Zachary says, I know a lot of the prominent Jewish folk down in Louisiana, down in New Orleans, and if if you send me down there, I'll I'll get them to you know unite uh, and be behind the Union. Well, when he's down there, he starts to talk to uh, Lincoln and to Seward about. Uh, he thinks he can arrange for a meeting with Judah P. Benjamin, who is uh, uh, a prominent member of the cabinet of the Confederacy, and. Uh, up until now, we never had proof that uh, 
that these two men met. He just, uh, we knew he offered this, but uh, in my research, I found, and I'm gonna show everybody, I found this letter in the Library of Congress. And uh, this is a letter written from uh, Issachar Zachary to Judah Benjamin, the day after they met in September the 28th in 1863 in City Point. And I just read to you what he says. If you look at the first paragraph, he says, I shall, he tells after the meeting, he, he begins by saying how delighted he was to meet and how wonderful it was to meet and talk. And then he says, I'm gonna go immediately to Washington from here and I shall have an interview with Mr. Lincoln and Lincoln, uh, with Mr. Lincoln, I'll, I'll talk to him. I uh, shall assure him that no propositions of peace may be expected from the South, but I shall put matters into the right light and I know he will listen to me. And uh, he thinks that is uh, Zachary uh, thinks that some good must come out of our unexpected meeting. And uh, uh, what we do know and I write about is that, uh, again, when he comes to him, just as John said in 1863 and proposes something, Lincoln will not take it because it's not unconditional. And that's all he'll, in, he'll, uh, he'll uh, 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 tolerate. But uh, here's an, uh, an example. Now, I wanna go to, back to John's book. One of the things that kept, me so fascinated from uh, uh, your book, John, was uh, uh, how often you would offer lessons that really do apply to today. And uh, in this cartoon that appeared, uh, it was a Courier and Ives a cartoon, you write about it, you reproduce it in your book, and you say uh, that uh, negative partisanship uh, can be very persuasive, you write. And you go on to say, and I'm quoting you, one demonizes, when one demonizes the opposition to distract your party's less defensible positions. That's what uh, you, you refer to as negative partisanship, mm -hmm. uh, demonizing the opposition to distract from your own less defensible <laughs> positions. And you cite this really interesting cartoon uh, as an illustration of how that was done to Lincoln. And yeah. I thought maybe you could expatiate on that a bit. I, I, I appreciate you giving the opportunity and, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that it's right up front so we can do a, a, a close reading here. It really is, um, even and especially when I see it now, so strikingly contemporary. And so you just described the technique of negative partisanship. And we hear this all the time in our politics. Sometimes it's called whataboutism. But it basically creates this extreme example of the other side as being radical to, uh, to, to, to distract from, you know, as you said, the, the less defensible positions of, of, of your side of the political aisle. But take a look at this. So it's 1860. The Republican Party is new. Um, it is a, a, a moderate progressive party, big tent, dedicated to the abolition of slavery. And uh, the, the Confederates, the, the Democrats, rather, uh, were, were sort of, um, they were conservative uh, and they were populist, um, rooted in the South. Uh, they wanted to conserve slavery. Um, uh, they wanted to, you know, they, they were still sort of under the sway of Andrew Jackson. There was sort of a, a rural agrarian populism, um, whereas, uh, um, you know, they, the, the Republicans were based primarily in the North, you know, divided into cities. And I will say, go back, you know, a lot of political divisions in our country from the very beginning, from the earliest days, the Republic had been urban rural. Um, you know, the, the, the party labels don't really apply. But take a look at this cartoon, because it tries to paint Republicans as basically being a Trojan horse for um, a, a series of very recognizable uh stereotypes about folks on what we would call the far, far left, the radical element, right? So um, if you see Lincoln's getting carried into a lunatic asylum uh, on the back of uh, a, a uh, Horace Greeley, who's a, a, a newspaper editor at the time, um, right? And he's promising utopia. Uh, you see the guy with the beard uh, holding a man and woman by the arm. He says, I represent the free love element and expect to have free license to carry out its principles. Uh, and um, so, so there you have this, this sort of a notion of sexual amorality. Uh, and, and he's got long beard and long hair. And then he's 
uh, the, the gentleman in his arm uh, is also an atheist, apparently. I want a militant atheist. I want religion abolished. And the Book of Mormon uh, uh, made the standard of morality. So it's anti-Mormon and anti uh, sort of uh, sort of conventional Christianity, I suppose. Then there's a racist caricature of sort of a dandified uh, black man. And uh, he uh, says the white man has no rights that colored persons are bound to respect. Uh, that's an inversion of an infamous statement by uh, Justice Cheney. Then there's a, a, a sort of a homely uh, looking matronly woman who says, I want women's rights enforced and men reduced to subjugation to her authority. Right. So this is all the specter of a, a female dominated society um, uh, and, 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 and sort of proto feminism. Remember, we're, we're well over 50 years away from women having the vote at, at, at this point. Um, so then there's a, a pauper who says, I want everybody to have a share of everyone's property, sort of you know, redistributing wealth. Then there's a guy who's asking for a government hotel where people who ain't inclined to work can board free of expense. It can be found in rum and tobacco. Right. So state subsidies of. Of, uh, of 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 sloth and, and and drunkenness, and then the last two I never noticed actually because they weren't relevant when I was writing the book. It's it's basically two folks arguing for de what we would call defunding the police, uh, and he's saying I, I want to guarantee that every citizen has a right to examine every other citizen's pockets without interruption by policemen. And the other person says I want all the station houses, the police station houses, burned up. Uh, and, and the police killed so the MPs killed so that uh, the bohos can run the machine and fight when they please. So here you have an almost perfect distillation. Think about all the negative stereotypes of 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 of, of left or center politics, and they say you know the, the, it, you know whether it's it's identity accusations of identity politics, feminism, defund the police, you know socialism, uh, uh, radical feminism, you know LGBT issues, whatever it is. They're all here in embryo, if you will, to almost a precise extent. And remember, this is before blacks, black Americans have the vote, before women have the vote. Um, so it shows how deeply embedded these stereotypes are, but also how effective they are politically and how specious they are. They are designed to prey on fears that are very deep seated. But the fact this is such a cut and paste job almost, albeit in a courier and Ives print, I think is is fascinating. I agree. And thanks so much for that. I, I, I was just intrigued. You know, all of us have seen so many of uh, the polit political cartoons about Lincoln, but uh, this was really amazing. And uh, and I, I focused on those last two, too. I couldn't, you know, it's almost as if it was a, a, a throwback in a sense. It's unbelievable. Well, look, we have some questions and Great. I, I want to invite my colleague, Lisa Frankel, to pose a few of them. And by the way, those of you who are listening, I understand that the chat may not be working for everybody. And so Lisa, why don't you give us your phone number? We want to, of course, just like, um, uh, just like, uh, I don't know, was it uh, Senator, which Senator uh, gave out somebody's phone number? We want to give your phone number out to the whole world, Lisa. So uh, uh, give people your number again. And, and uh, that way, if there are any additional questions we can ask, but go ahead and uh, we'll, we'll put some questions to Mr. Avalon. My information is in the chat if you want it. And we've had a few questions. Um, the first one is, do you think it's possible given the cost of running for office with all of the compromises that requires for a truly moral political leader to be elected? Of course. <laughs> uh, of, of, of course it is. I mean, I, I think it, D depends, you know, what what the boundaries of your morality are. But if by yeah. morality, by moral, truly moral, we mean someone with decency, uh, kindness, um, uh, a, a, a desire to play by the what I call in the book, as Lincoln did, and I was remiss in not mentioning this earlier, the politics of the golden rule. Right? Simply treating others as you'd like to be treated is profound and transcendent. And, and 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 absolutely we can we can have leaders who aspire to that understanding that they will be human and 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 humans are inherently imperfect um but i think that's also a little bit about us trying to apply the gold the politics the golden rule in our own society as well if we want to hasten the rise of moral leaders in our politics we need to vote for them we need to make sure we're not making excuses for people who violate values that we allegedly have because uh you know, we've somehow decided that we've tried to come up with a cartoon character image of the opposition. We need to make sure we're having fact-based debates. 
um, and, and, and that we are, um, that, that our, there's a relationship between our values and our voting, but absolutely. You know, your, your answer reminds me, there's a, a, there's a story that I reproduce in my volume that uh, uh, comes from uh, Carpenter. Uh, I think his first name is Francis, who's a painter, uh, a portrait oh, painter. Oh, Francis Carpenter, yeah, sure. Right, right. and he's, uh, he's painting a, a Lincoln and a, one, a congressman comes over to, to visit with Lincoln and says, you know, Lane, and he tells him, you know, why don't you come to church? You know, what kind of, what denomination you belong to? I don't know if you're familiar with this story. And Carpenter later reports, that Lincoln responds to him, if you can find me the church over the threshold, you find written the words, uh, the Lord is my God, the Lord is one, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. That's the church he says I want to belong to. Yeah. Yeah. So another question, and if you can answer this, it you should run for office. I'm just telling you. <laughs> She's one of our, our questioners says, would like to ask John Avlin why he thinks we have failed the message of Lincoln so badly during the last six years. And how do we get back to all the positive qualities of leadership? If there is there anyone in government now who approaches those standards? I, I do get asked this question a, a, a lot. And and again, I'm. I, I, it's not that we're going to find another Lincoln. It's important to understand that his qualities were rare in his time as well. I often point out that, you know, Lincoln is, I think, rightly regarded as our greatest president, but he was bookended by objectively two of our worst. Um, you know, you know, you know, James Buchanan and Andrew Johnson. Um, and, and, and for very different reasons, one of, of sort of weakness and prevarication and the other uh, uh, out of vanity and vengeance. Um, but but I do think that um, th that we need to look for people with a similar spirit, and we need to we need to to think a lot more about screening for character. Um, you know, history will teach you. And David McCullough, the late great David McCullough, you know, used to say that you know history really is about character. I mean, that's what makes history compelling. That's the transcendent lessons we take. That's why we study it. So you need to put character first and you need to be careful when you start uh, buying into a, a narrative that is disconnected from facts. And I think that's unfortunately what has increasingly happened in our politics right now. And the reason I, I like talking about, about history is that I think it, it, it allows us to talk about politics and the responsibilities of self-government. Uh, in a way that gives us perspective on our politics and problems today. So we can take a step back for a second and, and, and maybe find some, some common ground that way and then work forward. Uh, and, you know, in, in terms of contemporary politicians, I mean, certainly I think there are politicians who aspire to unite rather than divide. I think that's kind of table stakes. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it's rare. And certainly people are imperfect. Um, but, you know, when I think about the, the, the kind of people who you know, evidence that that kind of, of an attitude. I mean, uh, one I always mention, um, and it's not, you know, he, he he's sort of a throwback in some ways, but uh, the, the independent senator from Maine, Angus King, is also two-term independent governor. I think he's an extraordinarily decent man, and, 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 and he really does try to find ways to work with folks on both sides of the aisle, and he, he uses humor a lot, and, and, and he's focused on, on big goals and doesn't put everything through a partisan prison. Um, but but you know there are you know there there are people in our politics who um, approximate this. Again, it's a matter of looking for character, um, and, um, and and looking for someone who exemplifies or or aspires to that reconciling leadership that I think Lincoln did the most to to clarify that has been carried forward by some of the world's greatest leaders, including, you know, most recently Nelson Mandela. And his biographer wrote in the eulogy or uh, obituary said, you know, Mandela was Africa's Lincoln, in part because they sought to lift everybody up on the basis of their common humanity. You know, they didn't divide to conquer, which is what most political leaders do. Yeah, you know, it, it occurs to me uh, that, uh, you know, I don't think people, we, I, I think a lesson that I'm learning today or I'm, is coming into bold relief is, uh, you know, if the only piece of this is unconditional surrender, then, you know, we, we're not going to get anywhere, right? In other words, that's, 
that's uh, where we are in society. In other words, there's no such thing as um, a compromise. There's just unconditional surrender. And, and, and that's also in wartime. <laughs> you know, it's, but you're right. I mean, a magnanimous peace is, is the central part of that equation, even in wartime. Right. Exactly. Uh, you know, exactly. Lisa, better... do we have another question? Well, there's one that sort of follows up on, on what you both just said, which is how do we find peace when we're not in a war and we can't, you know, make, uh, let's see how they worded it. Um, sorry. Well, I think you understand. It's like we're we're not in a war, so there's no winners and losers. And so how do you make peace? How do you negotiate a peace? Well, I mean, traditionally we we've done it in a in a democracy by having hard fought elections and then and then remembering it's vitally important to come together as Americans again. Um, you know, th this was not a remarkable concept. I mean, Ronald Reagan in his 1980 inaugural address said, you know, began by talking about the peaceful transfer of power, talked about how we take it for granted, but how it's rare in the history of humanity and it's precious and needs to be protected. I mean, you know, you know famously John Wayne, very conservative guy, you know, uh, after uh, the 1960 election, which was incredibly legitimately close, um, uh, said, you know, about John F. Kennedy, I didn't vote for him, but he's my president. And um, I, I think it's been it's been made more difficult by the fact that uh, we've had a series of, of elections where um, we, we've, we're seeing a growing disconnect between the electoral and the popular vote. I think that that is difficult for our democracy. Um, I think the rise of, 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 of partisan media and the elevation of political identity over religious and community identity and other things that unite us, um, uh, I, I think, has, has been a, a disservice. But we, we need to start, we need to keep focused on the fact that we, that, that, that what unites us is much greater than what divides us as Americans. And that, and that we are all Americans and then individuals. Uh, and, and somewhere down the line of our identity, you know, Republican and Democrats, a, a pretty low hierarchy there. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we need to start acting that and living that. There's a lot of hatred that suffuses our politics today. And, and I think it's in danger of being normalized. Um, and I do think it's incumbent upon not only our, elect, our elected uh, leaders to lead, but, but us to all try to set an example in our personal lives. Um, I think that's vitally important. I mean, the other day I took my child, my son across a, a parking lot and um, I saw a white Mercedes SUV with a bumper sticker that said F Biden, didn't say F. And it was in a handicap spot. <laughs> and, and I just said, you know, what is going on where someone would not occur to somebody that a child could see and read that? let alone someone who has a Mercedes SUV in a handicapped spot. It's, it's just, it's just, I, I think there's a, uh, th that's the, the most concerning thing to me is in the past, we could always find a way to unite when, when, uh, when our nation came under attack. I mean, I, I, I participated, I, I worked for uh, Mayor Giuliani during the tax 9-11 and I was a, a young guy. I was a speechwriter at the time, but you know, we were able to reunite as a nation across partisan lines and put things in perspective. And the fact that we were seemingly not able to do that after our capital was attacked is very troubling to me. There was a Confederate flag inside the US Capitol. Doesn't reflect all the people who marched, um, but, uh, but um, you know, the historic resonance of that deep and, and, and we've got to find a way to, to, to reunite because we all do love this country. Let's not forget that. Yeah, I, I I really appreciate that, and I I want to just uh, underscore the idea of our own individual responsibility. Uh, they say all politics is local, uh, and uh, uh, I know uh, uh, that that's been uh, uh, a hackneyed phrase, but in certain respects, um, all neighborly list. No, neighborly, 
all neighborly behavior is uh, local too. And uh, in our own lives and in our own uh, inter interactions, uh, we, we can do as you've suggested. I think that's very important. Uh, Lisa, it, I think what we're gonna do, even though there are other questions, it, friends, you know, uh, John has to get ready for tonight. And uh, so we can see him later on CNN. And so I wanna bring our uh, webinar to a conclusion. So before, before we do, though, before we end officially, I, I do want to thank you, John, very much for, for writing this book and for making time to be with us at the American Jewish Archives and to our friends and speaking to us. Uh, you, you wrote beautifully. I want to say that it is a very readable, enjoyable uh, volume uh, that uh, in writing uh, communicates very much in the same pleasant way as you do orally. So thank you for giving us all this time and uh, we're very grateful. And um, all of you who are on and uh, we hope you'll continue to stay on our re uh, mailing list so that we can continue to let you know about our programs as we go forward. And now I'm going to ask Lisa Frankel who is the Director of Educational Outreach and Administration at the AJA to help all of us, those who are interested in getting a hold of uh, John's uh, book, uh, Lincoln and the Fight for Peace, and even if you'd like to have it uh, autographed. So Lisa, if you please, and I'll uh, put this up. Great, and also you will get the information tomorrow when you get a follow-up email. Thank you, or thank you, thanking you for registering for our webinar. So what you will do is you will write to j.solomon at huc.edu, give him your address and your name, and we will send the list off to Mr. Avalon, who will sign some book plates and will affix them in the book and send them off to you, j.solomon at huc.edu. Yeah, I see that the there's a little error in our slide. It, it just says J. Solomon. So those of you who are looking at it, make sure you put a period after the J and then everything will be just fine. So J period Solomon. And uh, uh, so uh, friends, uh, my gratitude not only goes to John Avalon, but I have to express my gratitude to the staff and the administration of the American Jewish Archives, in particular, as you saw, Lisa Frankel, whose contributions to the AJA over the past two and a half decades defy enumeration. Please remember to visit the AJA's website. It's very easy, as you can see, AmericanJewishArchives.org, where you'll find a recording of today's uh, webinar tomorrow. You'll find it posted tomorrow. And don't forget to visit the Hebrew Union College's online learning portal, where you will see the same recording if you want, and many other interesting uh, discoveries. John, thank you again. Thank you so much, thank everybody, for a wonderful and inspiring webinar. To one and all, I want to say goodbye. Shalom. Thank you so much for being with us. And we look forward to seeing you again in the not-too-distant future. Thank you. Thank you. nice. Okay. Thank you so much. Gary, that was a great pleasure. Thank you, my friend. And I, I look forward to meeting you in person one of these days. Me too. And thank you. I will go right to my computer now and see if I can great. find that email. And we'll... Please do. Yeah. And you'll if you want to write to him, just tell him I forwarded it. He'll, he'll, he, you, you won't have any trouble if you're interested. I so, will. I okay. My best to your family and thank you. Thank, thank you. you for all you're doing. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Take okay. care. Bye-bye.